<laughs> Are we on now? Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Charlie from the Way Biblical <laughs> Fellowship, and this week's Torah portion was um, Hi, I Sarah. <laughs> the life of Sarah. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sorry, I'm laughing. It's quite nice. Um, yeah, we we. Um, it's also the day we film this on the day of Halloween, so there's a bit in there about um, the festival of Halloween as well. Uh, but mostly we kind of looked at uh, what it means to be the bride. Um, obviously chapter 24 is focuses um, on finding a bride for Isaac and we looked at the relevance of that to us and the significance of it. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and we also had a little look at Abraham because um, we're not going to see Abraham in the Torah portions anymore. Um, so we just reflected upon his life a bit as well. And um, <clears throat> I hope you enjoy it. Okay, this week's Torah portion is Kai Serah, which is the life of Sarah. Um, <clears throat> now, if Abraham is the father of Israel, then Sarah is the mother. It's a week, apparently, when it's especially appropriate to give thanks for the positive influences the godly women that you've been privileged to know. A part of the legacy we receive from Sarah is that she believed in and followed her dream of husband where few women few women would go. In response to a divine call that she did not even personally hear, she nonetheless, at Abraham's word, left the only home she had ever known, as well as all her family members, and struck out on an odyssey fraught with both hardship and extreme peril. Quite a remarkable lady. Oh, and we read that she was very beautiful too. I found these wonderful <laughs> images on the internet. We are actually going to have a look at what it means to be beautiful in the sense of the Hebraic. Now, <clears throat> before we move on though, of course, today our local girls take being beautiful very seriously. For those of you who are watching online, this is, um, I don't know whether it's a local phenomenon, but um, the ladies locally tend to like to go out with rollers in the hair and this is actually quite, quite accepted and seems quite the norm actually. Now, Sarah was extremely beautiful with a kind of beauty that did not diminish even in the latter stages of her life. She was so beautiful that wherever she went, rich and powerful kings, men accustomed to getting what they wanted, desired her. Remember that Abraham had told her to say that she was his sister so that he wouldn't get killed on account of it. This must have been something really serious. And bear in mind that she was 65 when they came to Egypt. Now, she did live to be 127, but it's still pretty old. She's 65 and he's freaking out thinking, they're going to kill me because she's that beautiful. They're going to kill me. It's quite a bizarre thing, isn't it? She obviously aged well, unlike Keith Richards' mother, <coughs> as we've got a picture of that. It's not really Keith Richards' mother, but there you go. Now, let us consider the nature and essence of Sarah's beauty. The custom of the era and the necessity of desert life was for a woman to, at least in the presence of males, dress very, very modestly in layers of loose flowing robes, which concealed all their womanly attributes and endowments from view. Probably a little bit like these modern day people are dressed now. And she fits their environment, suits the actual custom of the, the people that they're in. Okay, so what was it about Sarah that would cause Abraham to fear that a man like Pharaoh, who could have any woman he wanted, would want her? Bear in mind, she's not even really, really young. To understand Sarah, perhaps we need to look at beauty from a Hebraic rather than a Greco-Western mindset. We have an idea, don't we, now of what beauty is, and it's... I think it's far removed from what the idea um, <clears throat> that they had in Abraham's day, perhaps, and certainly from the idea that the Lord has for what beauty is. I think that's quite telling. Rebel fashions. And here we have it, Genesis 12:11. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a beautiful woman to look upon. The Hebrew word translated as beautiful is yafat, or your thought. I can't remember how it's actually pronounced. yod fe tav It's an adjective derived from the verb root yafar, which is yod fe he Each letter is a pictograph, and the pictures build the meaning of the word. I'm sure most of us are aware of this, but it's worth just 
reminding ourselves that every single letter in the paleo Hebrew alphabet was an image and it symbolized something and it's excellent because it, it helps us to break down what a word is actually all about because we can read what it means from the pictographs so the Hebrew word translated as beautiful is yifar, yod, yod fe tav, which is an adjective derived from the, the root yifar, okay? And this word usually translated into English as to be beautiful is actually a Hebraic pictograph mural of the hand and the mouth serving as a source of revelation and inspiration, okay? When have we got it? The, um, where's, the, where's the mouth? Where's the hand gone? There's the, hand, there's the hand, a source of revelation, is the hay, sorry. Now, while Sarai at 65 may or may not have been a 21st century knockout under all those flowing robes and veils, she was definitely beautiful indeed, hence the hand, and in word, hence the, the mouth. And not only were what she did and what she said beautiful, those words and actions were also inspiring and full of revelation, hence the hay or the window. See, the hay in the um, Hebraic mindset it represents revelation. So her actions and the things that she said brought revelation. Of course, the fact that the hay at the end of the word used in Genesis 12:11 was replaced by a tav to transform the verb yefor into the adjective yefot meant in a, a, pict a pictographic sense, rather, that the revelation and inspiration which Sarah's deeds and words directed people was the fulfillment of the covenant, which is the Hebrew letter Tav, which, as you're probably aware, is in the shape of a cross. It's quite telling, really, isn't it? Now, what made Sarah beautiful thus was that both her deeds and her words made the richness and blessings of the covenant of Jehovah come to life wherever she went. And that's true beauty, and that's a beauty that lasts. And we can ask ourselves, is this a beauty that we possess? Do our deeds and do the words um, that come out of our mouth, that they pump, point people to the blessing of the covenant of Jehovah? And um, do we bring revelation for people that we're in um, company with? Sarah so was not just beautiful either, she was blessed, it says in Genesis 17:16, And I will bless her and I will give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Hebraically to bless, barak, means to release the object of the blessing from restrictions and limitations. So firstly, she was to have a son. That meant she was going to be released from being barren and her age limitations, they, they were real restrictions on it. And secondly, she was to become nations, which was a multi-generational blessing, which released her from the restriction of immortality. Such a blessing it was. Genesis 23, okay, we're going to begin... It says, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. It's fascinating that Sarah is the only woman in Scripture whose lifespan is given. And the Hebrew sages teach that the greatness of Sarah can be gleaned from the way that her age is written. She was 100, she was 20, and she was 7. So most people pass from one stage of their lives to the next leaving behind the previous stage. Each of these ages had something unique about it. The seven-year-old had innocence, the 20-year-old had strength, and the 100-year-old had wisdom. And Sarah retained them all throughout her lifetime, and that's what made her so incredible a person. It says in verse 2, And Sarah died in Kerjatharba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And I can imagine it was a, a very sad scene. And the Hebrew phrase or English Bible's trans, translators to mourn is lipsod, lipspod. And the verb root of this phrase is safad, which is samech pe, or slash fe, dalet. Okay, so the Hebrew word picture is that of a falling and rising again, which is the samech of the mouth, pe, at a doorway, Dalit, and it is a perfect picture of a person wailing in mourning. And the doorway, represented by the letter Dalit, in the most literal sense, means that the door of the tent or house where the death occurred. And in a figurative sense, however, it symbolizes the doorway of life, the gateway of the world to come. So, 
when I was looking through this, it just reminded me when I think of all the suffering and all the, the pain and the sorrow, and how, when you hear people mourning that intense grief, it just made me realize that we should praise Jehovah, that we look forward to a time when there will be no more mourning. In Revelation 21, 1 to 8, it says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this is an amazing verse. It is all amazing. This, this will be so inspiring to us, all of this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Some translations there say, No more death and no more mourning nor crying and these words are true and faithful we can hold on to these 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 are the words of the living god who doesn't lie and he said unto me it is done i am alpha and omega in the hebrew that would be the aleph and the taf the beginning and the end represented here i will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely and for those who say, show us a sign, and then we'll believe. If you want a sign that Jehovah is who he, say he is, says he is, and that he loves you, then here is your sign. The word in Hebrew for sign is aus, and it's aleph, yod, tav. And we've got what each of these means. The aleph is the ox head, meaning leader, first strength, God. The vav is a picture of a nail, it means secure. <coughs> the tav. It's a picture of cross sticks, meaning the mark of the sign and the signature. It's the picture of the covenant. And seeing as Hebrews read from right to left, we can read that it is God nailed to a cross. There is your sign. What greater sign could you have that the Lord is who he says he is and that he loves you? Or to put it another way, just think for a minute what that actually means. what he actually went to. What a sign. And yet the enemy mocks. The father of lies who has deceived the whole world, including most of Christendom. Modern day use, by the way, of the letter Vav. <clears throat> I find this fascinating. See, we can learn things from the Hebrew, uh, looking, breaking down the letters and stuff, and we can get meanings of words. But it's not lost on people who are coming with a different agenda. The modern day use of the letter Vav, three nails of the crucifixion. There's your 666, as you can see, this is the letter Vav. It's also got a numerical value, as we say, of six, so it's 666 here. And I've just written, the people who run these companies know exactly what they're doing. I just think this is interesting as well, unleash the beast, monster energy. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now when I read that, this also reminded me of a scripture we looked at recently as well, Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out, cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They reject the truth, the truth of the Almighty, the truth of his living word to create something of their own, something that's broken, something that can hold no water, that offers no life or no hope, something that is just going to bring death. And they prefer that over what the Lord offers, which is, as you can see, to him who is a thirst, he will give of the fountain of the water of life freely. And yet they prefer to make their own man-made, broken systems that hold nothing of any value at all. Psalm 118, verse 8, the middle of the Bible. It is better to trust in Jehovah than to put confidence in man. It doesn't matter what men say. It doesn't matter what kind of system they've hewed out and presented to you. It is better to trust in Jehovah and in his word than it is to trust and put your confidence in men. I think it's so sad that people trust, I don't know, these charismatic figures. 
when they've got a Bible sitting at home with all the words of life and truth right there for them to read. If they just pray, oh Lord, open my eyes and show me your truth. Lead me, Lord, in the path of righteousness. Trust in, the, in Jehovah, not in men. Yeshua is the word made flesh. Put your trust in him. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means the way is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you can forget relativism and postmodernism because that teaches that there's no absolutes. I and mean, also the life is the same yesterday and today and forever. Remember when the Lord says, he says, choose life as well. He wants us, he wants us to choose life. He wants us to have a relationship. He wants us to know who Yeshua is. Now, regarding postmodernism, <clears throat> postmodernism, relativism, there is no absolute truth. There's a, a, a meme that I found which I thought was interesting, which reads at the bottom if you can't read it. But officer, you're really not getting this postmodernism thing. Look, I realize that their truth might be that I don't have an account in that bank, but you see, they can't say that because to me the truth is that I actually do. See, this, the whole idea that you've got your truth, I've got my truth, there's no absolute truth. It's all, it's, it's quite a nonsense, postmodernism, another meme. What? I know to you it's a piece of furniture, but to me it's a fancy facial art. Okay. <clears throat> now we live in a postmodern world. Okay, postmodernism. Didn't you know that words only mean what I want them to mean? This is the this is the mentality of postmodernism. As 2 Peter 1.20 says this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And a lot of people would do well to, re to remember that. The postmodern Christian, hey, you're not hearing me. I don't know why it says this, but it says, you're not hearing me with your fighting fundy, with your worship of the Bible. I don't know what fundy is. But it goes on and says, I'm telling you that the truth is a plurality that's always evolving. So we can't really know for sure what the Bible means. All I know is that you're wrong to be so absolute in your beliefs. This is the postmodern idea brought into Christianity today. How do you refute the postmodernists? When they tell you that truth is relative and that there are absolutely no truths, how can you refute that? You can just ask them if they're absolutely sure about that. Because that kind of just shows how ridiculous that argument is. So postmodern times as a Christian guide to contemporary thought and culture. The emerging church quoting scripture. No, God can just talk to the hand they're not interested. No. This is a guy called Rob Bell, who's um, a pastor at one of these emerging churches. He's quite popular. There's some quotes by him. This is part of the problem with continually insisting that one of the absolutes of the Christian faith must be a belief that scripture alone is our guide. Sounds nice, but it isn't true. Okay. He then goes on to say, the Bible is a product of human work, not divine fiat. He obviously hasn't read it, has he? I can't find one place in the teachings of Jesus, or the Bible for that matter, where we are to identify ourselves first and foremost as sinners. Okay, so this is a guy who's from the emerging church with this postmodernist idea. Um, <clears throat> aggressive Christianity says this, don't you know, words mean what I want them to mean. They can twist scripture to mean exactly what they want, what suits them. Now, the word of God actually defines its own terms. Jehovah's definitions, by the way, are the only ones that count as well. You can say this means, oh, and oh, yes, and oh, we've got an art. Righteousness is this, and it's, oh, and it's, it's making sure everybody's got enough tea. Hang on a minute. Let's have a look at what the scripture actually says. Um, it's absolutely, it's a completely futile practice to actually define your own terms and then try and read the scriptures in, like that. Say, for example, this term, truth. This term that has become so relative in our time. In Psalm 119, 142, it makes it quite clear. It says this, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy Torah is the truth. So there you go. The truth isn't relative. We're told exactly what the truth is here. Verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, this is back in, this is from Revelation as well. 
But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Now, just so we get this clear, all liars, this will be as defined by Scripture. And we've just seen what the truth is defined by Scripture. So now we know what liars are according to Scripture. Those who speak against or in opposition to the truth, which is the Torah. They shall all have their part in the lake. Uh, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Note that we know how Jehovah defines the truth. I'm just making the point again that all liars bit should really have a lot of meaning now when we read that. It should be like, wow, I get it. I really do get it. And if we're unsure about a word, then, as we've seen, investigating the Hebrew pictograph letters also gives us great insight. A very simple example is the Hebrew word our English Bible's translates as father, which is av. Aleph Vait or Aleph Vait. The hieroglyphic word picture is that of the Holy One, the leader, the strong one, which is the Aleph in the household, which is the Bait. So he's the leader of the household. This is the Father. Also, there is the rule of the first mention, and we'll discuss that later. There's no excuse, basically. We must not let men at any point place their own definitions on things to tickle people's ears and tell them lies. Uh, that are not things said in love. Oh, is it, oh, it's all about oh, said in good. No, it's, this is, if you tell people lies, you're not, it's, there's nothing loving about it. It's hateful, it's dangerous, and it's wicked. And please don't let people take scriptures out of context either. Examples of nonsense that can be avoided by letting scripture speak for itself. This is something that you might hear people say, Oh, it's not so much about following the commandments or any of that stuff for me. I just love the Lord and let the Holy Spirit guide me. Yeah, I'm spirit-filled and there's no condemnation in Christ. I've got his righteousness. Yeah, love and peace and blessings and all that to everyone in Jesus. Oh, and it all sounds lovely and it's all fairy and fluffy and wrapped up and it's got sugar on the top and... Let's just see what the scriptures say. <clears throat> Don't listen to the vain imaginations of men. There's people in the world who just speak things that people want to hear, and they're really popular. And you know, a lot of them are like this chap here, very charismatic. You know, he's, he's hip and he's trendy, and he's got. I think this is Justin Bieber, thinking, "Wow, this is brilliant." But we really need to see what the scripture says. Here's some examples of truth. 1 John 5, 3. But this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So if you've got such a... Ah, oh, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. Well, they are. Keep his commandments, and don't say that they're a burden. Don't find it a chore. Do it just with a... Oh, so willing. Wow, this pleases my God. I'm going to... Oh, I can't wait. This is excellent. Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So for all those people who oh, I'm just led, oh, spirit filled and I'm just led by the, the spirit. Hang on a minute. The spirit will cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. That's what Jehovah says. Romans 8, 1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Brilliant. Love it. Let's just stop there. Let's go no fit. No, hang on. Let's read the rest of it. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Ah, ah. And what does the Spirit cause us to do? The Spirit causes us to walk in the statutes of Jehovah, to keep His judgments and to do them. It couldn't be more simple. It really couldn't. And it shouldn't be grievous. It should be absolutely such, wow, thank you, a privilege and a joy to do it as well. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So if you're claiming the righteousness of Yeshua and you are not practicing righteousness, then you've been deceived. Because it's only him that doeth righteousness that is righteous as Yeshua is righteous. And righteousness is doing divine law. It's quite straightforward. And there's a postmodern idea as well, isn't it? That I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. I hear that a lot. For a start, we don't read about believers living in heaven. We read that Jehovah comes and makes his abode with men. We read it in verse 3. The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. See, this is the idea that most of the world has. Welcome to heaven, here's your harp. And, and the other, welcome to hell, here's your accordion. Actually, most people I know would think it was the reverse. But there you go. Now, also ask yourself, whose definition of good is it that creates the standard? For example, is it this bloke's 
idea of what is good that creates the standard? Is it this bloke's idea? And then I just write, oh, I forgot. It's you, isn't it? Because you created God in your own image. That's what most people do. They create a God in their own image. A God who absolutely and utterly <laughs> resembles them in every way. Who actually approves of the things that they do. Maybe he gets a little bit upset now and again if they do something. But it's never terrible. It's always a God in their own image. Do these people decide who's good? Do these people decide what the standard is? They're all, you know, I don't know. They're all in nice suits and in fine surroundings and I don't know. Do these people, the ones who are, you know, lifted up by the media and promoted, the ones who have glowing words spoken about them, the ones who write books, big best-selling books and appear on television and I don't know. These people, the people in the strange costumes, <clears throat> I really don't know what's going on. This character here, this is freaky. And that is one heck of a medallion. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. But are these the people who decide what is good? Who is good? Let's define good. <clears throat> tov in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word tov does not merely mean pleasant or pleasurable. It means capable of, presently engaged in the process of, and destined for, completely fulfilling the divine purpose for which it was created. That's what good is. It's not a, it's not a case of, he's good, this character over here with the guitar, because he's, he's just lovely and he sings nice songs, and me, Nan liked him, and he's got a lovely jumper, and he's, oh, he's, oh, he's, he's rude, he swears and everything. That's not what it's about. Good is actually, let's read it again. Capable of, presently engaged in the process of, and destined for, completely fulfilling the divine purpose for which it was created. I'll just put it to you that <clears throat> something, for example, like um, a Sunday service, which gets people to come along to worship on a Sunday, as opposed to on the Sabbath, okay, <clears throat> that isn't good. Because that stops people from fulfilling the divine purpose for which they were created and that is to be in communion with the Lord and to share in his Sabbath. That was made for man. So that isn't good. Now let's have a look at what evil is. Similarly, evil right, is something that is not fulfilling its divine purpose. That for which it was intended, that is something that is evil. Something wicked is something that stops something or someone from being capable of being engaged in fulfilling their divine purpose. So I'll put it to you. That, that said Sunday service is actually wicked. In the Lord's eyes, it is wicked. It is a wicked thing. And I'm not saying meeting on a Sunday is a terrible, wicked thing, but if it takes people away from actually following divine law, the Torah, which is to meet on the Sabbath, then it is a wicked and an evil thing. It's not, oh, it's all right, really. It's not. You might think it's all right. You might dress it up and think it's good like this guy playing his guitar here. But actually, it's more like this to the Lord God Almighty in his way of thinking. And that's the only way that counts. It is wicked and it is evil. If you want to know how it feels for Jehovah to wipe every tear from your eye, if you want to escape destruction, then be led by the truth and be led by the word because the word is truth. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So for all these people who think, oh, I'm a good person, I'm all right, no, let's hang on a minute. Let's see what the scriptures say. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death. Ah, all have sinned. Ah, okay. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Lord. And John 14, 6 says this, Yeshua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. People really, really need to know this. I meet people, um, and some of them are really lovely, well-meaning people, and they have this idea that we can all get to God, and yeah, we've all got different paths, and it's all about peace and love and getting along, but see, that all sounds nice, and it sounds good, 
but not good and nice, not good defined by the Lord, not good according to what his word says. It's actually wicked and evil teaching because the truth is that there's only one way and that is through Yeshua. And we must in love tell people this. Now remember Bereshit, we talked about the problem with our idea of right and wrong. That once we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we saw everything through the filter of our desire. So what we like is good. What we don't like is bad. And before this, we understand right and wrong in terms of truth and false. Well, the word is the truth and it's a tree of life for us. We really want to get back to that and if we want to have any idea again of what it truly is truth and false and looking at things like that we need to do it via looking through the scriptures because we're completely skewed by our desire as you can see from this picture she's looking over there she thinks oh this is really good and oh that's all bad things just get all messed up now regarding desire <clears throat> there's a guy with a phenomenal mustache called Friedrich Nietzsche who maintained that the problem with religion was that it was anti-desire and that without desire the world would be a pretty dull place okay fair comment well religion may be against desire but Jehovah isn't he just doesn't want us to be ruled by it and he doesn't want it clouding our opinion of good and evil Jehovah gave us the ability to have desires. Remember, Eve desired the fruit before she ate from it. If you will, desire is like the engine in a huge, powerful car. That's very exciting, isn't it? Now, maybe even a more huge and powerful car <laughs> like this. Okay, because some people, the, the, you, you, we have desires. It's just a natural thing. We were given desires. Okay. It's great having a big engine. <clears throat> this big load of desire but without this you're going to end up in lots of trouble you need to be able to direct where you're going we're safe and blessed when we let the word of Jehovah guide us now <clears throat> as I say most people their idea of what is good is what they like that idea of what is bad is what they don't like, which is how it's so easy for them to make gods in their own image. Oh, oh yes, I love God because I like all the things about him because it's all about what I like. And people get completely <clears throat> messed up when they make moral judgments about things because they've lost the sense of what is truth and what is false. And the only way that we get it back is through the word of God because as we've seen before, his Torah is truth. And we need that to be able to steer all this desire that we've got in us so that we don't end up in a big car wreck. Now bearing all this in mind, <clears throat> ask yourself about your stance on Halloween. This is just one of the pagan holidays that seems to be being really bigged up. It was not really a big deal when I was a kid, but now it's, it's just become huge. Is it just a bit of harmless fun? Is it a good laugh? Is it just a good laugh? Is it one of those things that's for the kids, really? <clears throat> and you've got to make a bit of a fuss for them, haven't you? Oh. Is that what it's about? Now, before deciding upon your stance, consider the following. In Isaiah 5.20, it says this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Deuteronomy 12.29-32 says this, when you over your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you and that you do not inquire about their God saying, how did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship Jehovah your God in that way for every abominable thing that Jehovah hates they have done for their gods for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods everything that I command you you shall be careful to do you shall not add to it or take away from it right bearing that scripture in mind let's investigate Halloween this day has its origins in the full moon closest to November the 1st, the new year of real witches and warlocks. They believe that it is a time when the spirits are at the peak of their power. 
Now, Halloween began over 2,000 years ago among the Celts and their pagan priests called the Druids. Picture of modern-day Druids here. I think that must be Stonehenge, mustn't it? The Druids celebrated two special nights of the year, Beltane and Samhain. Beltane took place on May the 1st and marked the birth of summer, and Samhain occurred on November the 1st and signified the death of summer. Samhain, a night celebrating death and hell, was the Druids' most important ritual. It was a terrible... Please bear this in mind. It was a terrifying night of human sacrifices, and it was the original Halloween. Now, we've just read in Deuteronomy. Let it, let it still be in your mind as we go through this, what the Lord said. Okay, let's have a look at dressing up in costumes. That is ridiculous. I've never seen such a ridiculous... I'm scared of spiders, and I'm, I don't think that's scary at all. Dressing up in costumes. The Druids believed during Samhain the mystic veil separating the dead from the living opened. The Druids taught these roaming spirits loosed on Samhain went searching for a body to possess. So the frightened Celts would masquerade as demons, evil spirits, and ghosts, hoping to convince the roaming evil spirits that they were another evil spirit so that they would be left alone. So if I look scary and terrifying, they might think I'm one of them, and I'll be all right. So the Celts also prepared meals as treats to appease the evil spirits from tricks or malicious acts, hence the custom of trick or treat. Ah, oh, isn't it cute, trick or treat? Well, actually, is it? The Druids performed horrifying human sacrifices and other vile rituals during Samhain. Now, I don't know if you've seen the Wicker Man with his sticker, a chap in a great big Wicker Man, and they set him to fire. This was a Druidic practice. <clears throat> Adults and children alike would be thrown into huge fires while the celebrants danced around them in demonic fits of abandon. By morning's light, only ashes and bones would remain. These were called bone fires, which is where we get the tradition of bonfires today. I only found that out when I was researching this. Quite freaked me out there. The Druids believed that black cats were reincarnations of the evil dead and were possessed with supernatural, and, uh, supernatural knowledge. Bobbing for apples was part of the Druidic New Year sexual divination ceremony for fertility. The broomstick and witch's hats were originally considered phallic symbols. It all, it's all bad. It's, it's all really bad. I've, now, I've actually heard this thing about the bobbing for apples as well. There's different ideas about certain things that went on with regards to it. Now, I think we have to remember that during the time that we're talking about, the Druids were extremely powerful. They were really feared. These people had a lot of sway. They were very superstitious people, and they had a lot of power over them. Um, they would go to estates, and they would demand people that they could sacrifice. So in fear of these druids that they would hand over people to them. Um, <clears throat> these people then would be brought to a place of sacrifice where they would literally be burnt alive on these bone fires. But before they were taken to be burnt alive, apparently they were given an option. And the option was, with their hands tied behind their backs, if they could put their, immerse their faces into a boiling hot vat and get an apple out between their teeth, then they would be set free and they would have the option of trying to do this. Apparently, records of it, that the injuries were so horrific that people would be blinded, they would lose their faces, they would, some of them become deaf, um, <clears throat> they would be permanently disfigured. The cruelty that went on <clears throat> is pretty horrific and yet people celebrate it and think it's just a bit of harmless fun. We read in Deuteronomy what the Lord thinks. Don't do these things. They remind me of the abominable things that all these people have done. And everything about it speaks of something that has got a root which is totally and utterly abhorrent. Now about the Druids. The Druids would drink their victims' blood and eat their flesh. Is a quote from Strabo Geography. Since they are man-eaters as well as heavy eaters, and since further they count it an honourable thing when their fathers die to devour them, and openly to have intercourse not only with the other women, but also with their mothers and sisters. Okay, remember Halloween was their festival. The Druids also celebrated the festival of Beltane, and the word Beltane literally means the fires of Bel. Bel is the same god called Baal found over 80 times in the King James Bible. 
Most of our current Halloween customs derive directly from Baal rituals. On November the 1st was Samhain, Halloween. Fires were built as a thanksgiving to Baal. That's from Kelly Ruth Edna, The Book of Halloween. It's another quote here in the American Book of Days. The mystic rites and ceremonies with which Halloween was originally observed had their origin among the Druids. Ancient Baal festivals from which many of the Halloween customs are derived. Surely we must know that this is wrong. That this is completely and utterly. If we take part in this, it's just like thumbing the nose to the Lord God Almighty. It's a festival of death. Our God is a God of the living. Halloween can be traced directly back to Samhain, the ancient Celtic festival honoring the Lord of the dead. Proverbs 8.36 says, All they that hate the Lord love death. Our custom is obsessed with death. I see people walking around with skulls and I, I, I don't get it. Black and morose and dark and heavy and even songs. I, there's this, I don't know, this... There's no celebration of life. It's, it's, it's all wrong. So how did we get from Samhain to Halloween? As the Catholic missionaries swarmed Britain and Ireland seeking the mass conversion to Catholicism, their orders from Pope Gregory in 601 AD was to cunningly convert the Druid rituals into Catholic rituals. The Catholics converted the ritual of Samhain into the festival of All Saints Day, which was a day of celebration and prayer to the dead saints. Now, the Catholic festival of All Saints Day was also known as All Hallows Day, with the word hallow replacing saints. On the day before, All Hallows Day was recognized as All Hallows Eve. Eventually, All Hallows Eve became Hallows Eve, Hallow Even, Halloween, and ultimately, today's Halloween. It's still celebrated today, All Saints Day, is it? Uh, Westbury UMC's choir, along with the orchestra, will perform the requiem and the service to worship and honor those saints who've gone before us as picture of somewhere in Sweden or Denmark where they put candles all over the graves. As I say, it's, it's all to do with the dead. In 835, Pope Gregory IV blessed All Saints Day as a sacred day of obligation. Sacred day, eh? Consequently, on that day, the Catholic Church officially ordained Halloween. And one commentator states, Halloween owes its very life and breath to the blessing of the Catholic Church. Samhain would have breathed its last breath many years ago if not for the ordination of the Catholic Church. Bravo. Well, while Halloween masquerades as childish fun and frolic, it's serious business in the occult world. It really seriously is. Witchcraft, wicca, Satanism, paganism believe that on the night of Halloween, devils and spirits are unleashed. They perform their most hideous and potential, uh, potent rituals on the night of Halloween. There is something that's happening every Halloween. It's quite ironic, this is from Glenn Hobbs, who was an ex-Satanist. It's quite ironic how one group of people are thinking it's fun, and another group of people are taking human life. And yet there seems to be this wall, and nobody wants to face the facts of what's really going on. Noted New Age researcher Tex Mars said this, Somewhere in America in the week prior to this coming Halloween, children will be kidnapped by witches and become statistics as missing children and I've heard plenty of stories that link the people who go missing to satanic rituals and rites and then there's this idea oh I'm a good witch I'm a white witch's witch and witches don't have anything to do with worshiping the devil okay the witches like to let's, let's just remember as well and uh, it doesn't matter what man's opinion is. It matters what the Lord's opinion is. Well, let's, let's continue reading. The witches like to make a distinction between themselves and Satanists. There really is no distinction, biblically speaking. They might play little word games masking the connection, but the power behind Satanism and witchcraft is the same. Satan and his demonic hordes. When the Bible makes reference to witchcraft, it means anyone who was involved in some form of the occult. And the word occult comes from the Latin, meaning secret, hidden, or esoteric. Private, understood only by a few. That's what esoteric means. Um, and knowledge or practices. So, oh, I'm a good witch. I'm a white witch. Witch, witches don't have anything to do with worshiping the devil. And you'll see these people, and they profess to be. Oh, there's a couple of them, of lovely, lovely witches. 
Okay, well, they practice the occult. Why does the occult come in the forms of divination, seeking to know the past, present, or future by astrology, horoscopes, channeling, tarot, etc.? This can include animal or human sacrifice, sorcery or magic, seeking to control or manipulate reality for one's own purposes. This can include animal or human sacrifice to accomplish that end. It's really quite sick, isn't it, that you get all these little spell books for young girls now and. It's all about, oh, you can make things the way you want them to. And it, it is all about this, trying to control you for your own purposes. And it's promoted in a way that appeals to people's flesh. And Spiritism, seeking to communicate with the dead or other entities through a medium. All these things are wicked. In Exodus 22:18, it's quite clear. It says this, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's quite straightforward, isn't it? Jack-o'-lantern. If witches are the queens of Halloween, the smiling jack-o'-lantern is the king. The demonic jack-o'-lantern leaves most historians baffled, tracing its spooky origin. One popular tale tells of Jack who tricked the devil uh, in a deal for his soul, but the origin of the jack-o'-lantern is much more sinister. It arrives from the druid's ghastly reverence of the severed human head. They proudly decorated their houses and temples with bloody severed heads. And the Druids believed the head housed the soul, hence the light or candle in the skull. And the original jack-o'-lantern was not a pumpkin or a turnip, but a severed human head. And apparently he would travel around with these severed human heads to these different estates, demanding that people were given to them for the purpose of sacrifice. Yes. It has been, this is from uh, Rogers Nicholas, Halloween, from pagan ritual to party night. Yet, it has been the gay community that has most flamboyantly exploited Halloween's potential as a transgressive festival. Indeed, it is the gay community that has been arguably more responsible for Halloween's adult rejuvenation. Okay, while many deem Halloween as harmless fun and fantasy, Halloween subtly disarms our, and especially our children's, discernment of witches in the occult. Now, Dr. David Enoch, former senior consultant psychiatrist at the Royal Liverpool Hospital and the University of Liverpool, this place here, uh, I've been myself, he states this. This is a scientist, by the way. Halloween practices, uh, Hall sorry, Halloween practices open the door to the occult and can introduce forces into people's lives that they do not understand and often cannot combat. It's not harmless fun at all. So given all this, do you still think it's a bit of harmless fun? Is it not what we define, it is not what we define as good and evil that counts. Our ideas are clouded by the filter of desire. We need to look to the truth. That is the word of Jehovah, his truth. And again, I'm going to read it, Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 32, because we should really, really, really take careful attention to this. When Jehovah your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go into dispossess, and you dispos dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow after them, after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same? You shall not worship Jehovah your God in that way, for every abominable thing that Jehovah hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Imagine asking your wife not to play a certain song because that's the song that was playing when burglars broke into your house and murdered your family in front of your eyes. And your wife says, yeah, but I really like it. And goes ahead and plays it anymore. Says, oh, it's just for the kids, isn't it? This is just, a, I've just put this here. That you'd think, what a horrible wife. What a, that's just, ins how could she do something so horrendous? And yet we think it's okay to play around with all this stuff that reminds the Lord God Almighty of all the abominations and all the people that were sacrificed and murdered and all the things that went on. We just think it's a bit of harmless fun. Oh, it's all right. I'm um, sorry, but we're just having a bit of fun. It's for the kids. It's just not acceptable. It's, it's horrendous. Halloween is not accepted by Christ. The Bible condemns these practices. So why do Bible believers celebrate them one night of the year? 
Let's have a look at some of the scriptures we've seen this one before. Exodus 22, 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Leviticus 7, 26 to 27. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. There shall, be, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto Jehovah, and because of these abominations, Jehovah thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am Jehovah, your God. So this great big engine that represents desire. Don't crash. Jehovah, he chooses and points the way and he asks to you. He just says, choose life. Deuteronomy 30.15-19 choose life. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of Jehovah your God that I command you today by loving Jehovah your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and Jehovah your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn, are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. So if you want to be one of these, where it says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Then hearken to the voice of Jehovah and not the vain words of men. So let's get back to the Parsha. Verse two, <clears throat> before we went off and a bit of a tangent. Sarah died in Kirjatharba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, the rest of the chapter deals with Abraham's dealings in purchasing a burial place for Sarah and culminates in the following verses. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machvalah, which was before Mamre, the field, and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machvelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field in the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So the cave of Machvelah, the word there means double, whether it's a joining field and orchard, is the first parcel of real estate that was acquired. Later, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, will purchase a plot of land near Shechem. A third piece of land, the threshing floor of Onan, which is the site of the Holy Temple, will be purchased much, much later by Abraham and Jacob's descendant, David. And the rest of Eretz, Yisrael, was acquired directly from the hand of Jehovah. It is, interestingly enough, that these three purchased areas, Hebron, Shechem, and Jerusalem, that have consistently provided the most controversy with other people of the region. Now Hebron. The Hebrew root of Hebron is Shava, and it has the meanings of close associations, couples, or companions. Like Jerusalem, Hebron is considered by the sages to be a place where heaven and earth meet. Tradition says that Adam and Eve were buried in the cave of Machvah in Hebron, and that Abraham was aware of this. And Adam and Eve would have been joined by Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah. So it was a place of couples and companions indeed. And later Joseph was also buried there. Now, after Sarah's passing, though Abraham will live and walk faithfully with Jehovah 37 more years, he will remarry and he will father six children by a second wife. He will never have another recorded God encounter. A theophany, I think they're called. 
Something about Sarah's presence in Abraham's household seemed to open windows of divine revelation to him. Rivka's presence in Sarah's tent is actually going to do the same thing for Isaac too. So, <clears throat> in the grand design of Jehovah, it seems that a matriarch's presence does things like that. It's an interesting thing to bear in mind, isn't it? Now, the next generation, the unmistakable message of the Parsha is not that Abraham and Sarah died, but that when they died, the Brit Jehovah cut with Abraham and Sarah did not die with them. The subject matter of the Parsha is a proof text for the continuity and the, the, indeed the eternal nature of the covenant under which Sarah and Abraham found life. Therefore, in this Parsha, we not only see Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, assume his father's position as the carrier of the glory of Jehovah, but we also see Isaac take a bride, paving the way for yet another generation to be born. I'll just take a quick swig. This brings us to promises. Jehovah had also promised Abraham that the numerous descendants he would father would one day possess all the land then known as Canaan. This is an amazing promise. But all he had received thus far on that promise was the deed to an exorbitantly priced field near Hebron in a cave of which he had laid Sarah's remains. <laughs> so he must have been like, hmm, okay. Jehovah had further promised Abraham that through the multitude of descendants he would have all the peoples of the world will be blessed. He must have been thinking, how's this going to happen? <laughs> what's this exactly, what's it going to look like? Um, yeah, in this little cave and, oh. <laughs> but the Lord made these promises. Okay, but this <clears throat> whole idea of promises, it reminded me of something that JP told me. And it's regarding promises. <clears throat> so I'm just going to, I'm just going to share it with you. JP asked Jehovah regarding me and him. He said, how come we tarry and yet we don't seem to be blessed in the way that the scriptures might suggest with regards to wages and things. And, you know, we, we don't really have an income or nothing. And please bear in mind that when he was asking the Lord, he wasn't asking because he was unhappy and he wasn't asking because he was complaining because neither of us are unhappy or complaining. He was just curious. He was just thinking, yeah, how does this work? Because, you know, thought we were promised to this and that and you know he was just curious and he was just asking the Lord now <clears throat> prior to this he was reading the book of Ezekiel so he's reading the book of Ezekiel and he thinks this and he's like well what's, that, what's going on Lord? so we stopped and he, and he prayed and he prayed oh Lord will you please reveal to me because I'm just curious and when he looked down to continue reading this is the thing that he read which I thought was quite <laughs> it made it stopped him in his tracks. Ezekiel 29:18 to 20. <clears throat> Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was rubbed bare. So it sounds like it was pretty heavy going. Yet neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he had performed against her. Therefore, thus says Jehovah God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall carry off its wealth and despoil it and plunder it, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt as his payment for which he labored, because they worked for me, declares Jehovah. I don't know. I think that's <laughs> quite fascinating. I know it really freaked JP out. But it just... <coughs> It's something that we must bear in mind. Like, for example, Abraham, he's, he's sitting there with his cave and he's thinking, get all the land and what's, what's happening? But the Lord's faithful and we just have to trust him and the way he works things out is marvellous. It's beyond our comprehension. So always, always look to the promises, but don't, you know, don't expect things to work out the way you want or the way you think they should, shall we say. The Lord has a plan for each of us and it's, it's far and above our, um, anything we could work for ourselves. Now, Bill Bullock Sr. said something on promises, which I thought was great. <coughs> he says this, Promises, particularly the prophetic promises of Jehovah, are wonderful to hear. But between the promise and the fulfillment lies a great sea of challenge and adventure. Seeing a promise through to fulfillment involves a process of co-labor and partnership with the one who made the promise. First, we have to be made ready to serve as good stewards of that which is promised. And then the environment around us has to be made ready for the subject matter of the promise, not only to appear, but to survive, to mature, and to flourish. It's great. 
Abraham's response to his situation in regards to the promises was this. If all nations would be blessed through his descendants, someone besides his age itself was going to need to get busy making descendants. Makes sense. The next part of our Parsha is all about finding a bride for Isaac. And this should interest us greatly because the cast of characters in chapter 4 is as follows. It's, <clears throat> it's a wonderful bit of scripture. Now the cast of characters, as I've seen them, is thus. Abraham represents Jehovah the Father. The servant, who is believed to be Eliezer, he represents the Ruach HaKadosh. Isaac represents, he's a messianic figure, he represents Yeshua. So when it's trying to find a bride for Isaac, it's trying to find a bride for Yeshua. Rivka, she is the bride of the Messiah. So if we want to know what the bride of the Messiah looks like, let's have a look at Rivka. The ten camels that go on the journey, the ten tribes of the, of the house of Israel, they can be seen to represent that. Laban, who's one of the dodgiest characters in the whole of Torah, actually, sadly, he's a bit like people you'll find in Christendom. The rest of Rivka's family is <coughs> basically a lot like the rest of Christendom. And of course, if we want to be the bride, then we must study this chapter to see what characteristics are evident. So why is being the bride important? Because obviously there's the bride and then there's the wedding guests. Why is it important to be the bride? Apart from the obvious, obviously. Well, in Matthew 24, 21, <clears throat> with the obvious being, if you really, truly love the Lord, what else would you want to be? Chapter uh, 24, 21 says this, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Okay, there's two types of believers in scriptures. There's the wise and the foolish. And it was a, a chap called Dave Sheard. We, listened, we, 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 um, we went and spent tabernacles with him and his family. It was brilliant. And he, <clears throat> before that we met him and he gave us, um, he gave us a, a disc to listen to. It was about the wise and foolish virgins. It was really, really impacted, impacted us at the time. So there's two types of believers, the wise and the foolish. And the wise of the door open to them. Hear it? And the foolish are locked outside. The door's open to those who've got oil in their lamps, closed to those without. As you can see from the picture. One of them fell asleep. Right, the door, <coughs> Revelation 3, 7 to 10 says this. You know, we're trying to piece all this together. I know we've been over this um, in different parties, but it's really important. If we want to know who the bride is and why it's important to be the bride, we must, must really get a hold of this. Revelation 3, 7 to 10. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. That's what we want to hear. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. This is so important. Has a little strength. In other words, you're not a great big swelling mass, are you? You've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. And Hebraically, it does not deny in his name means we've not denied his character. We've not misrepresented him in any way. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. That's just the assembly of Satan. They don't make any associations there. Which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. That sounds marvelous, doesn't it? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, that's trial, trials and troubles, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now this is interesting to me. Those of this, it could just as easily be translated assembly or church even, of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. I will make them come and worship by thy feet. We'll be doing a study to actually see what is actually um, going on with this scripture a little bit more. But what we should really focus on, really important for us at the minute, is this whole thing here. Keep you from the hour of trials and troubles which is going to come upon all the world. In other words, there's going to be nowhere it's coming across the whole world. There'll be nowhere to just run in and have, and oh, it isn't happening here. In my little lovely village or whatever. To try them that dwell upon the earth because you've kept the word, patiently kept my word. 
And this is the kind of things that the Lord's going to keep us from. The horrors going on in the world today. And people can be really blasé about it and just think, oh, it's, a, oh, yeah, it's all far away and it doesn't really affect me. And I'm not going to get all stirred up. But this is the real, real troubles are coming on the earth. And I put these images up just to make people realise, hang on a minute. These are real people and this could be real people like your good self. And people hurt. People hurt now. All over the world there's people hurting because of all these troubles. I don't think your police forces or your armies are going to protect you either. There's a picture of some people just before they get shot. There's a time coming on the earth which the Lord describes as a time like no other time. Now, back to the door. Matthew 25, 10 to 11. Don't want to be the people locked out. You want to be the people who go in. So let's find out what's, what's happening. While they, the foolish virgins, were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in to him, to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Just like we read in Revelation, <laughs> the door that I'll open it, no man shuts, but if I shut it, no man's going to open it. Afterward, the other virgins, these are all like Christians too, they're all, you know, of the same, the, you know, they're, they're actually waiting for a bridegroom too. <clears throat> they came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, expecting this door to magically open to them. We've been waiting for you to, hang on, what happens? They get locked out. I'm going to read now in Hosea 2, 14 to 16, what this might be about this door. Okay. <clears throat> It says, <clears throat> it's, a marvel, it's a marvelous book, Hosea. It says, Jehovah's mercy on Israel. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. Again, we have this thing of the door. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares Jehovah, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call me my Baal. There's the Valley of Acre, the door of hope. It was actually a place of defeat, but it's going to be a door of hope. Who do you represent and who are you? Are you a foolish virgin or have you got plenty of oil in your lamp? See, the people in Revelation 12 that I talked about who were taken to a safe place. I believe these are the people who the door is open to. The people who were protected. <clears throat> these are the people who've got oil in their lamps. Well, there's a picture there of the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's a reason for it. And the next slide should make it a bit more obvious. Because Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane means it's the Garden of the Olive Press. And the lamps, the oil for the lamps was always the olive pressed olive oil that was what the oil for the lamp was and I just think it's so telling that Yeshua in this garden is recorded as <clears throat> saying this he withdrew from him about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed this is just before he was taken saying father if you were willing remove this, kip, kip, this cup from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done and I think that is the secret of having oil in your lamp is to get on your knees and say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And if you want oil for your lamp, that is the attitude that you'd have. The wise are protected in the last days, Proverbs 133. Whoever hearkens unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Not so the foolish. Remember in Revelation 3, it talks of you're of little strength. And we're not talking about great hordes of people. Because most people will be classed as the foolish ones, the ones who didn't have the same attitude, didn't have the attitude of, not my will, Lord, your will be done. These people who actually, what they want to listen to is men. They don't want to listen to the word of God. They want to listen to somebody who tickles their ears. They've got their own idea of what's good. It's what I like. And I like this. I like what these people say. People who do not want to be challenged, they do, want, do not want to bend the knee and surrender the, their lives to the Almighty. Revelation 3, 15 to 19 talks about these people as well. It says, I know thy works, that I am neither cold nor hot. 
I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and I am increased with goods and I have need of nothing. <clears throat> and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I think this is so, so fascinating. These people who say, I am rich, I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing. The Lord in his mercy will take all these things from them. All the things that they think they can hold fast in, that they have security. Their riches, the fact that they think that they are doing really well and that they are really blessed, he's going to take it all from them so that their eyes will be open to realize that they are wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked in his eyes. And it's an act of mercy, a complete and utter act of mercy. That thou may be rich, because this gold tried in the fire, that's the fire of the tribulation that is coming. And it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't matter what you do, you can call it whatever you want. If it's not done for him, it's just wood stubble and hay and it will get burnt up. And he's saying, get some gold tried in the fire of tribulation. That thou may be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesolve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chaste, and be zealous therefore, and repent. Make teshuva. Turn from doing things your own way. Turn from following after men who've tickled your ears and told you what you wanted to hear. Turn from that and turn to me. I think this is a marvelous thing where he says, get some eye salve for your eyes that you can start to see because these people are walking blind most of the time and the Lord he will shake things up for their benefits and they won't think it's a good thing obviously when it's happening but it's a merciful thing that the Lord is doing now the foolish and the wise have spoken of by Yeshua when he did his sermon on the mount Matthew 7 24 to 27 everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock the rain fell, troubles, troubles come, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. If there's anything that you get from this whole Parsha, it is listen to the voice of the Lord, hearken to his word. Don't decide what his word means either. Find out what he meant by it. When he says, talks about truth, find out what he means by truth. When he talks about righteousness, try and find out what he means. Listen to his words. <clears throat> Be wise. Hearken to the voice of the Almighty. Because it goes on and it says this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his, hand on the, his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew because there is trouble coming. It's inevitable and all these things will come and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it and it will be great. When this time of trouble comes across the whole of the earth, it will be great. The bride is the wise one who gets to go into the bridal chamber. I love this in Song of Sol Solomon 8.5. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on our beloved? We've looked at this before. <clears throat> We're talking about the wilderness and where is the wilderness. We've seen the picture of the eagle and we've seen that there's this place that keeps getting mentioned, which is Petra, and the wilderness being the same wilderness that they travelled from in the first exodus. And we just read these scriptures. Revelation 12. The woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God, which is to be nourished for 1260 days. The woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for time and times and half a time. A place where she will be safe. I believe this is the description of the bride. I believe this is the description of the wise, the ones who hearken to his voice. And here we have a picture of <clears throat> where the wilderness is. And here's the eagle's head, and there's the wings, as you can see, depicted here. And it's the, is this the wilderness where the Israelites wandered with Moshe? Exodus 19.4 You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. 
It's the same thing happening again. Revelation 12, 14. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. This is interesting because this only happened in the last 35 years that it, it joined the cross and it's exactly in the shape of an eagle's head. So, in part two, let's see what it means to be the bride. Because I think it's important. <clears throat> Aye, aye, Sarah, part two. <coughs> okay, getting back to it. Um, let me make this, show this is on correctly. Okay, now the main topic of our Torah portion is finding a bride for Isaac. This is nuts, this, but the entire story contains 67 verses with many details and drawn out monologues. And we know that Torah often tells dramatic stories in a few brief verses and in condensed form. The entire creation story contains only half the number of verses. Even the significant story of the Aikida, which is the binding of Isaac, contains only 19 verses, which very few of the details included. So, this is quite... This is really quite wordy for the Torah. Right, we'll begin in chapter 24. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, But I pray thee thy hand under my thigh. <coughs> Who? This is a bit of a strange thing that they did back then. Don't do it anymore, do we? <coughs> and I will make thee swear by Jehovah, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country, unto my kindred, and take a wife unto my son, Isaac. So she can't be a Canaanite. To understand the reason for this, we must go back to the incident which occurred after the flood when Noah got drunk and his son Ham disgraced him. Without going into all of the details, it's Ham's son Canaan who was cursed by Noah. In Genesis 9, 25 to 27, it says this. And he said, Cursed be Cain, and the servants of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Jehovah, God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. In Genesis 12, 5. So they came to the land of Canaan, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then Jehovah appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So you see, this is the reason why Abraham was not willing to consider a Canaanite wife for his son. Now, marriage. <clears throat> the story of marriage, uh, so, sorry, the story of mankind in the Bible begins and ends with a wedding. In Genesis, Jehovah brought Adam and Eve together. And in Revelation, Jehovah brings Messiah Yeshua and his bride under the hooper to pledge their troth. In the books of Exodus, Song of Solomon and Hosea, all have marriages as their theme. And the Torah was given as a shitra arosan, a vow spoken at a ceremony of betrothal, which was the meeting at Mount Sinai. Messiah Yeshua first manifested his messianic authority at a wedding in Canaan of Galilee and two of his most powerful parables, uh, parables were wedding parables features really heavily doesn't it marriage so this is an important thing getting a wife for his son verse 5 and the servant said unto him peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest and Abraham said unto him beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that sware unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. He really doesn't want Isaac to go to Haran, the place where he was from. Husband and wife, okay, the Hebraic connection. Ish and Isha are more than just genetic descriptions of a male and female of the human species. Ish is a Hebrew pictograph of someone bearing Yehovah's, i.e. the Aleph's, manifest active presence, presence i.e. the Sheen. Uh, Isha is a he Hebrew pictograph of Yehovah's, represented by the Aleph, manifest active presence, i.e. the Sheen, being revealed and made visible to the world, i.e. the hay, which is about revealing and revelation. So as Genesis 2 makes clear, there is an intimate connection between an Ish 
and the Isha who is to be his wife. To be an Isha, the woman must bring out and perfectly reflect the image of Jehovah, those aspects of Jehovah's own glory which Jehovah placed in the man that she marries. A wife who is truly an Isha will draw out of her Ish, her husband, the godly light that is in him, and will bask in that light and will cause that light to be broadcast into the darkness of the world. Bear in mind that Torah is all about what marriage is all about. Namely, catching the rays of basking in and reflecting in the world around us the glory of Jehovah as is betrothed. I love that picture. <laughs> I can only imagine what they were talking about before they started laughing. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. That's such a weird thing to do, isn't it? But obviously there's, you know, different culture, completely different. I just can't imagine it. having a serious conversation. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. Right, that's about 500 miles by camel. <laughs> that's really quite a journey. It's just interesting in the way scripture just says it, like, really quick, quickly. Just, and he went, and he, and he went there. It's 500 miles, that could have been, like, adventures and all kinds. You could probably write three novels in what happened in that time. And it was on a camel as well, a camel. <clears throat> I've got some good pictures of camels in this presentation. So Nahor, the brother of Abraham, means snorting or snoring. So although the descendants of Nahor were from Shem, they were sleeping. The city where Nahor lived was, Mes it was in Mesopotamia, which is Babylon. The bride must wake up and come out of Babylon. Remember from Lech Lecha that that meant leaving behind the lies inherited by our forefathers. Come out of here, my people. But these people were asleep. You now the burden of the task Abraham <clears throat> thus put on the servant was absolutely monumental. Think of it, how is a servant, suppo a servant supposed to go about picking a suitable wife for his master's son out of a bunch of complete strangers? He knew that upon this union, uh, he knew that upon this union would hinge not merely Isaac's happiness, but the future of the covenant of redemption between God and man. That's heavy going, isn't it? What else could he do but pray? But before the prayer, we read this. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. In verse 11, we are told that the ten camels are kneeling down at the well of water. And I think this is really interesting. The word for kneel is barak, which also means to bless or to bend the knee. These camels will drink from the waters of the well. Water being a picture of the word, the Torah. Well being a Hebrew word meaning to see or to make plain. Therefore, ten camels have been led by Eliezer, who represents the Ruach HaKadosh, to kneel, bend the knee, at the water, which is the Torah, of the well. A place where they'll be able to see. So Eliezer's test is to see if the young maiden will provide water from the well for both him and the camels. And the root of the Hebrew word for camel means to ripen or to wean. So we can ask ourselves this, do the ten camels be the ten lost tribes who are being weaned from their paganism as they are kneeling at the waters of the Torah for understanding so that they can start to see? So the bride that Eliezer is looking for is one who is eager to meet the needs of those ready to kneel before and to drink from the water of the word. I just think that's fascinating for the picture for the bride. Now, it's interesting as well that <clears throat> this servant, he's at a well and he's gonna meet this woman who's gonna be the bride. Um, and it's a bit similar to later on in, this, in uh, the Torah when we read Jacob. He ends up at a well and he meets a woman who's to be the bride. But he has a completely different approach. He's not like the servant. The servant prays Jacob, he's all carried away with himself and ends up kissing the girl. <coughs> completely different. But this is the right approach, isn't it, to things. It's a monumental task that might appear in our life. What else can we do but to pray?
And I think his prayers are amazing. And he said, O Jehovah, God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. This is this remarkable that he's, uh, he's praying on behalf of his master. It's, I don't know. But please note this as well. Kindness and kindness. Because many commentators point out that this story is thematically about kindness or chesed in the Hebrew. The servant even sets up a test in which he is primarily looking for a girl who will kindly offer not only him but also his camels a drink. And on a linguistic level this test is bracketed by kindness as the servant prays for Jehovah to show kindness to his master Abraham both before he states the test and at the conclusion of his prayer. So in the search for the bride right from the offset kindness features heavily. When looking for the bride for Isaac who represents the Messiah kindness plays a really major role. That should be interesting to us. Now the prayer that the servant prayed was an ambitious prayer to say the least because a thirsty camel can drink up to 25 gallons of water at a sitting and these had just completed a long journey with a heavy load so they would have been really thirsty. Multiply the 25 gallons by 10 you got 250 gallons of water just for the camels. Now a water jug carried by a girl might hold 5 gallons and when full of water the jar would weigh a lot it really would five gallons i think a gallon's like about eight pints it's like 40 pints of water that means drawing and hauling water for hours on end that would have been ridiculous and that means backbreaking work long into the night and it seems doing all of that for a total stranger <clears throat> no ordinary girl would do this it is a physical feat in itself which led me to find these pictures that's just ridiculous isn't it and, and even more mostly i'm not suggesting that this is what uh, she looked like by the way but <clears throat> there you go she must have been a physical specimen to even comprehend doing this and it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold rebecca came out who was born to bethuel son of milcah the wife of nahor abraham's brother with her pitcher upon her shoulder the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will give water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. I'm not, in, in, you know, I'm not just going to give him a little bit until they've had enough and she hasted she does everything quick please this is a, a theme as well and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again onto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels so please note it's what is it she hasted uh, she hasted she ran <clears throat> note she offers to let the camels drink until they've finished drinking this is over and above what the servants asked for Rivka not only displays kindness but also displays a servant's disposition as she's constantly rushing to fill the needs of this stranger that she calls my lord and his camels and once she's completely taken care of their thirst the next thing we see is Rivka running home to tell her family please when we're going through this this is a picture of the bride of Messiah this is why it, this is such a long protracted bit of scripture it's for our benefit it's so that we can see what the bride and messiah the bride and messiah will look like bear in mind that this servant represents the ruach hakadesh going in search of a bride for yeshua this is what we're being taught told about as we read these scriptures so all these attributes that she is demonstrating are things that we should really really take note of by stepping forth and offering to fulfill all the needs of a total stranger and as many camels, Rivka proved that she was purely a giver of heart. A giver understands and emulates a creator who gave us our soul, our body and everything that we need. A giver loves her creator and others as herself. She fulfills the greatest commandments according to the Torah and according to Yeshua. 
Rivka had no idea who Eliezer was. That is what makes her kindness to him so amazing. She displays the kindness character traits of the true family of Abraham. I think this is lovely <clears throat> that she did. She had this attitude of being a giver. And to be a giver, you have to be a person who's grateful. A giver loves a creator <clears throat> and recognizes that everything is, wow, is a gift from him. Kindness. Let's see <clears throat> what the New Testament has to say about kindness. Ephesians 4.32 And ye be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. She said, Drink, my Lord, and she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. The Hebrew word for pitcher is kad. Its Hebrew root means to make deeper. These pitchers for water were tall, symbolizing depth of teaching. Rivka lets down her pitcher to her hand, symbolizing that Torah is meant to be brought forth not just by our words, but by the works of our hands. And that is faith. Remember before when we looked at why was it that Sarah was beautiful and we looked at what, was, what it was to be beautiful and it was that your, your words, but also your actions brought revelation to people and taught them of the fullness of the covenant of Jehovah. So it's by bringing this picture down to her hands, it's about demonstrating to her. It's not just, we don't go out and just talk to people and this is what you're doing, you're doing. It, you demonstrate it. That's why Abraham was chosen because he walked, he walked the way that we were to walk. He was an example to all. And we'll have a look at Abraham a little bit later. But... <clears throat> I think it's important because you can think, hang on, so the bride's the one who, who, um, who was willing to teach uh, oh, and, and teach from the Word and all this, but it's, it doesn't just mean people who get their Bibles out and, and can explain it really clearly and wonderfully. It means people who teach it by the way that they live, the way they demonstrate it for other people as an example. That's what it's talking about. And that is faith. And as James 2.17 says, thus also faith by itself. If it does not have works, it's dead. We're talking about faith in action alive. Verse 21, and the man wondering at her held his peace. Basically, it's saying that the man just stood there gaping at her, going, Phew, wow. A bit like this picture here. I like this picture too. I think it's great. To wit, whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not, he must have been in this is just amazing. This is, uh, wow. Could this really be? This is a ridiculous mission that I've been sent on for my master, that the Lord would bring this to fruition, that he showed that much favor to my master. And it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And he said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? She said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. I've written there in big letters, hospitality hospitality is a major major feature of the bride the girl has just identified herself as the granddaughter a bit more tea for me here the granddaughter of abraham's brother nahor he must have been like that wow i don't believe this she was indeed a member of the family of terach and abraham so what was the appropriate response for the servant or for us to make, you know when things go really well for us and it's like, wow, this is brilliant. What was the appropriate response? Was it crack open the bubbly and say, get me everybody, I'm brilliant. Let's celebrate. Or perhaps there was some other response. Well, let's see what the response was. And sadly, too many people's response is this. Too many people's response is, it's going great, get me, aren't I fabulous? Gather around and let's celebrate how brilliant I am. But let's see what the scriptures say. This is how the servant dealt with this. The man bowed down his head and worshipped Jehovah. He said, blessed be Jehovah, God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I being in the way. Jehovah led me to the house of my master's brethren. It's brilliant that, isn't it? That's really just brilliant. And it's so, I don't know, it's not all 
flowery and everything is it's just real in fact let's let's have a look torah is usually very concise words in torah are divinely inspired and are for that reason generally used sparingly hence when without warning us here torah suddenly turns verbose and we encounter long narratives with what seems like unnecessary detail we owe it to ourselves <coughs> to be sleuths like sherlock holmes and dr watson the best, I always say it, the best Sherlock Holmes ever is Jeremy Brett, and he's dead now. But we've got to ask ourselves, why? Consider that in last week's Parsha, Vaira, in the course of a similar detailed narrative centered on the journey Abraham took with Isaac up to Moria, we encountered, without even noticing it, the first biblical usage of the verb root of what is frequently translated into English as worship. In Hebrew is Shakar. In Genesis 22.5, we were told that shortly after arriving at the Moriah, Abraham told his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Then the word there, which means vish nash, I can't pronounce that. It says we will worship. And then he goes on to say, and then we will return. So let's see, what we're doing here is we're seeing, we're going to just investigate what's going on. Now, the Lord of First Reference, which was mentioned earlier. We're going to have a look at it. It's a familiar principle of interpretation of the Bible, and it tells us that the first mention in the Bible of a reference to a spiritual matter is very important in understanding the true, pure interpretation and meaning of that spiritual matter. In this case, the spiritual matter in question is worship. And the law of first reference means basically that in this first reference to and description of worship lies the secret to both the heart of what it means to worship and the kernel for all truth about what worship is. Worship is all about obedience. Even the obedience that it takes to take your son, the son of the promise who you waited all that time for, to take him up the hill to lay him down and to sacrifice him this Lord of first mention gives us a perfect idea of what it is to worship it's all about obedience do you imagine the obedience that it took as well we're coming we're, we're going to be gone we're going to worship and then we're coming back there's the amount of faith that was involved in that quite incredible isn't it but please bear in mind as well that it wasn't just Abraham it was Isaac as well because he wasn't a little kid who couldn't defend himself or anything he had to be a willing partaker of this as well I think some of the symbolism is incredible the fact that he carried the wood up himself and it's all remarkable isn't it you find he looked behind him and there was a, a ram caught in the thickets it's the picture of like the the crown of thorns and everything. Romans 12:1 says, I beseech you there, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just as Isaac, our picture of Messiah, did, we're to offer ourselves in his act of obedience, which is true worship. We're to offer ourselves every day as a living sacrifice. And you know, it's just remarkable that in this verse, it actually doesn't even make that out to be such a grand gesture. It just says, it is your reasonable service. If you recognize, if you truly recognize who the Lord God Almighty is and what he's done for you, it's, it's kind of like the least you can do. Back to today's Parsha. What we have is the first descriptive picture of a man worshipping in the Torah. Okay, so there was not a lot of discussion in the story of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac. Um, we just, we get from that story that worship is all about obedience. Now, here we've got a descriptive picture of what worshipping is as well. Now, this man is not a king, he's not a priest, he's not a musician, or for that matter, a person of any particular worldly talent, title, or exalted status, whatever. He's just a servant, that's how he's described. Just a very, very humble man with a servant's heart. He is also not a native-born Hebrew, proving that you don't have to be to worship Jehovah. We get to see him being real 
I think this is what's important, as I mentioned it before. It's just real. There's nothing here for show. He's not trying to impress people. He's just being real. He is worshipping Jehovah. And what he's doing is, he's bringing the fruit of his lips. Now let's take another look. <clears throat> the man bowed down his head and he worshipped Jehovah and he said, Blessed be Jehovah, God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, Jehovah led me to the house of my master's brethren. Let's just look at some of the attributes. The man exhibits the following traits. Humility. Undoubted, it's full of humility, his prayer. A desire to serve rather than be served. I think this is remarkable as well. He, he, it's a grasp of the importance and the great honor of the mission for which he has been placed on the earth for such a time as this. Do we have a grasp of the importance that, <coughs> that we carry with what, what the Lord has given for us to do? And also he's full of gratitude. He's also full of awe. Gratitude, Lord, I can't believe that you would be so kind to my master. And also, oh, wow, Lord, that you would do this. this you're just remarkable. You're incredible. It's just a simple, lovely, real, down-to-earth, honest prayer. It's true worship from a man who has displayed obedience, and he's just offering the fruit of his lips in thankfulness to the Lord. Since this passage contains the first descriptive usage of the verb worship, it provides us a benchmark by which to measure any worship practice. Please note what was not a part of this scene. Okay, this just cracks me up. Traditional or contemporary worship. We have a style that fits you. Wow. <clears throat> Two services, same truth. 8.15, classic worship service. 10.45, modern worship service. One church, two styles of worship. Join us 8.45 and at 11 a.m. I think that's really quite sad. A style that suits you. I, um, I know that churches use music to draw people in and it's about entertaining the people. That's wrong, it's totally wrong. That's not what worship is about at all. It's, it's really, really quite horrible. Because it's not about us, it's about him. So what actually happened there? All that happened was that in spontaneous response to a manifestation of the goodness and covenant faithfulness of Jehovah, a man like any man, not particularly spiritual, as we would ordinarily define the term today, he blessed Jehovah and thanked him for his faithfulness and his kindness. This is worship in its purest form. It is simple, yet it is supremely profound. It is something that should repeat itself in similar form and expression <clears throat> tens if not hundreds of times each day in the lives of a people who walk in covenant relationship with Jehovah and aspire to be his friends. It's um, <clears throat> something that I've learned that just makes your life so much richer to live in it and you live it with a, with a thankful heart when you truly um, you truly start to appreciate all that the Lord has, has done for you all that he gives every day and the incredible blessings that he bestows us with I think it is the way to truly know Shalom. His sense of well-being and wholeness. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Remember as well, it says, <clears throat> Not everyone in hell is the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of my Father. Ephesians 5.20, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. Now I just, because <clears throat> I'm soft in the head probably, just wrote a list down of things to thank Jehovah for. And it's, you know, you could go on forever, but I just wrote a little list. Breath, your breath. I mean, that's a good starting point, isn't it? Smiles. 
socks with no holes in, the sun coming up, the wind, chairs, especially when you're really tired, woods with great trees, colours, talented people, your own talents and gifts, kind words, the last time Jehovah chastised you, chips, having a pee, especially when you're desperate, washing machines, bananas and to a lesser extent plums, guitars and to a lesser extent pianos, scruffy looking dogs, old men with large noses and unruly nostril hair, laughter, more bananas, smell, smells, smelly cheese, the book of Psalms, eccentrics, explorers, pillows, pullovers, jam makers, acrobats, early morning strollers, hugs, having your eyes open to the wonders of his word, walking with him, the road ahead, the joy he put in your heart, the love that you have for him, and the love that he has for you. We should always be giving thanks to Jehovah. I'm walking <laughs> with, with that gratitude. And um, when you do, life is completely transformed. And to offer him the fruit of your lips. But don't to do it in a contrived way, but to just do it in a real, in a real honest way. Not going to impress the Lord by your eloquence or anything like that. He's just interested in hearing you express your gratitude and sharing with him honestly so I honestly some of these things on the list are, I think are brilliant especially I just love walking in the woods and um, I think I said it the other day uh, to someone it's like he's saying creation into like I don't know a wonderland for me it's like I can't, I can't walk through the woods where, where I go walking without just being constantly amazed and, and thanking him and just seeing his hand in all these things and it's, he's beautiful and he's just, he's always giving to us if we're just open to receive from him. But let's do it with gratitude. His praise should be continually on our lips and we should worship him with every breath we breathe, every move we make, every word we speak and every thought we think. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the, little, the little model railway, <laughs> which is, I love it, I love it. It's in, a, it's in the place where I walk, it's one of the fields and <clears throat> I'm just really blessed to have a nice place where I can go walking. And there's a lady who lets me, <laughs> she lets me walk a blind dog. <laughs> Because when I walk in the woods on my own, <laughs> when I'm walking in the woods on my own, especially if there's women coming and stuff, because I usually wear a hat and I've got a long coat on, it's very difficult not to look like a weirdo, or, you know, this strange man walking on his own in the woods. But if you've got a dog with you, you know, right? So I walk this blind dog. And you have to be very careful. Sometimes I forget and forget that she's blind and I hear her, boop, and <laughs> she's in a state. But I try my best. Now, <clears throat> there's another story in Scripture, I'm not talking about Jacob now, this is in the New Testament, of a woman at a well. There's a Samaritan woman that has a conversation with Yeshua. All the early believers would have immediately made the connection. Now, Rivka is described in Torah as prototypically young, pure, and chaste. The Samaritan woman at the well, on the other hand, was none of the above. She was representative, in fact, of the exact opposite. Rivka is depicted for us in Torah as the consummate servant-minded helper. And when Yeshua asked the Samaritan woman for a drink the way Eliezer had asked Rick for her for a drink, what did she do? Well, she chastised him, then argued with him about genealogy, then challenged him on his theology, and finally turned around and asked him, mockingly, for him to give her a drink instead. Indeed, if you read the narrative carefully, you discover that the Samaritan woman never did offer Yeshua a drink. So with the servant in Rivka, we are introduced to a personal worship at a well. Yeah, we heard his prayer. He worshipped the Lord. In John's Gospel, Yeshua said to the Samaritan prostitutes at the well, John 4, 23 to 24, this is a woman who has basically not got the attitude of a servant who doesn't have this um, <clears throat> pureness, chasteness. This is what Yeshua says. But the hour cometh and is now when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit 
and in truth. So in the first instant of the well, we've got this picture of what worship is all about with the servant. In this story, which is like the complete opposite, Yeshua actually talks about worship, and these were the words that he spoke about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, John's original audience understood that Yeshua was teaching through this passage that Rivka's descendants were unbeknownst to them now trapped in a religious system of false temples and empty theologies. So if we want a picture of what worship is supposed to look like, we have to go back to the first well and the humble servant who just simply offering thanks and get as far away from this woman who's all mixed up with theology and all trapped up in the religious system of false nonsense as we possibly can and just get back to the simple servant at the well just giving a simple prayer of thanks. Now it says, and the damsel ran, she's off again she, and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebecca had a brother, and his name was Laban. Boo! And Laban ran out to, unto the man, unto the well. And it came to pass when he saw, he has a very telling this, when he saw the hearing and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, oh I, and when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well, straight over, he's interested now, he's seen the, he's seen the, the booty, hasn't he? Laban means white. When speaking of the corrupt Pharisees and scribes, Yeshua says, For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outward, outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And I remember JP mentioning something about the fact that it, white is, is, it means it absorbs no light, which is a, a great description of Laban. <clears throat> He's not a good character. And he, Laban, said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Right, let's just break this down a bit. Laban had no business offering the invitation as if he was the head of the household. Laban is in fact a dark character, full of darkness, yet he clothes himself very nicely in garments of light. We know what motivated Laban was the size of the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms. Right, and he claims for himself that which belongs to the Father. Having never asked the Father's will, he presumes to speak on the Father's behalf. His mouth is full of flattery. Now, I think this is something worth noting. God does not flatter, he does not have to. Love and acceptance emanate from him like light. Back to Laban. He punctuates his sentences by throwing around God's name. He takes credit for the work of the father and others in the father's household. Okay. Just remember that the servant represents the Ruach HaKadosh. Your Laban types are very interested in the gifts of the spirits. And not having a close relationship with the father are not fussy as to <laughs> what spirit. I'm making a point here that this character Laban he's interested in the gifts he just wants the gifts he's actually not that's what he that's all he's interested in and he reminds me of all the people who desperately go and search of experience instead of Jehovah all these people who are interested in the gifts oh what's this oh what's that um, instead of actually being interested in Jehovah and himself people who want a spiritual experience to validate their unholy sinful lifestyles because a lot of the time that's all this is about going here and there seeking these spiritual experiences just to make themselves feel good about a lifestyle that they actually know deep down inside is is actually wrong and Laban he's just interested in the gifts he's not that's that's all he's interested in it's it's he's that type but what saddens me is when I, I find out about the way a lot of Christendom has been I don't know duped into sensation seeking really and uh, impressed by things that are, are false just going after the this the thing all that like glitters and um, see if you have no relationship with the father and it, that's not what your your goal is it's so easy for you to be duped and if you're not rooted in the word and it's so easy for you to, to actually think this this is all good, this is great, the Lord is blessing us. Wow, and there's an interesting documentary about the, the Kundalini spirit in the church, which is 
Well, I say it's interesting. It's quite horrifying, actually. But it, it kind of completely nails where all this nonsense is coming from. The warning. Acts 5.32 We are as witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him. The Ruach HaKadosh, I should say. And as J.P. is always mindful to point out, that means not so much the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of Holiness. What's holiness? It means being set apart unto the Lord and not being like the world. Uh, who is the, this Ruach HaKadosh given to? Him that obeys. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. We should take note of this. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for Hasitan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. There's a lot of people <coughs> masquerading as angels of light, a bit like Laban in our, in our story. And um, they sadly, they take people in all the time. But please, please, please note that this is the case. The Ruach HaKadosh, whom God had given to them that obey him, William Bullock Sr. says this, <clears throat> I love this quote, It is inevitable that we will come face to face with Laban sometime, but the one place we should never run into him is in the face staring back at us from the mirror. Certainly not. He's a dark character who tries to come across, like I say, full of light, but he certainly is not. And the man came into the house and he ungirdled his camels and gave store and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. So Laban's attitude is not servant-like. <clears throat> In fact, his words reflect a bit of pride. Laban continues to offer provision for his guest, but unlike Rivka, he seems to let the servants of Abraham take care of himself. So the point has been made that Rivka and Laban are not alike in their motivations for hospitality. Now, let's compare Rivka with Abraham. And remember, she is the lady who ran to help. She made haste. She ran. She was always, quick, quick. I want us to compare it with Abraham. Because if we want to know what the bride is like, I think we can find something out here which is quite interesting. I want us to take a look at the scene in Genesis 18. I think it's from the Torah portion, Nitzavim, when <coughs> Abraham has the three visitors. Genesis 18, it says this. <clears throat> then Jehovah appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Apparently, this is the way the story goes. Abraham used to sit at the door of his tent looking out to see if he could see people passing by and he would rush to them and he was just looking for opportunities to be hospitable, to show hospitality. Is that what we're like? Do we look for opportunities to demonstrate hospitality, to, to get, take care of people? It says, so he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran, whoop, he's running, from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. He's being humble and he's being like a servant. He said, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by in as much as you may have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried, oh, he's quick again, into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran, okay, to the herd. He took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. <coughs> Meat and dairy, by the way, as JP pointed out the other week. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So, discovering who the bride is is what we're focusing our attention on at the minute. Both Rivka and Abraham had serving attitudes and their eagerness to provide hospitality and kindness to travellers is evidenced by their hurried actions. And in both stories, their hospitality seems to extend way beyond what is necessary. She goes to the extent of, till they finish drinking, I will sort them out with this water. Abraham goes mad and makes this great big, great big feast. 
So, continuing in the comparison between Abraham and Rivka, we notice that several key phrases are repeated in the command section of each story. So let's go back to Genesis 12.1. Now Jehovah had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right, your country, your family. Let's have a look at the comparison in Genesis 24.4. Abraham says <clears throat> to his servant, But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. In verse 7, your father's house. Jehovah Elohim of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. From where? From my father's house. To a land that I will show you. In 24 verse 5 it says, And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will be not willing to follow me to this land. The land that he would show him, that she would show to Abraham. Must I take your son back from when she came? So you can say, country, your family, your father's house, to a land that I will show you. All these things in the two accounts. So according to Abraham's instructions, the wife of Isaac must be someone like him. Someone who is willing to be taken from their land, their family, from their father's house, and brought to a special land in order that Jehovah might bless them to become the mother of a chosen people. This young woman as well must be kind and servant-like and eager to take care of others' needs without selfish motives. In other words, she has to be like Abraham. So when we look at what Abraham was like, it also gives us a picture of what the bride of Yeshua is like. She represents the bride of Yeshua, and she's just like Abraham. Now, if you think about what was Abraham like? Well, we'll look at it. We'll go through it. Are you the bride that the Ruach is searching for? Do you have a servant's heart? Are you willing to put yourself out to help others, even strangers? Do you seek opportunities to show hospitality? See, Abraham, I think if people who, who knew him would have been trying to describe him, people who knocked about with him, shall we say, one of the things that they would have said about Abraham is that he, he, was inc- he showed incredible hospitality. And um, this has to be something that basically is a characteristic strongly identified in the bride. That this hospitality and this looking to help and to just to ease people's burdens and to show them kindness. These are, these are things that, um, I don't know, we really need to be aware of um, if we want to be the bride of the Messiah. Are you willing? This is another thing that Abraham was, he was willing to do this. Are you willing to leave everything behind to go to a far off land that you know little about? Are you willing to do that? Because that's what Abraham was willing to do. So ask yourself if he's the, and, 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 no, and, and this is also what Rivka was willing to do. Are we willing to do it? to go to a far off land that you know little about in order to wed a Messiah that you've never met, relying totally on the Ruach represented by the servant and what he reveals to you, because that's what Rebecca was like in the way that she modeled what Abraham had done previously. She was just like him. And just from what the servants had said, she was willing to go to a far off land. Is that what we're willing to do for the Messiah, for Yeshua? And what if this far off land is taken away into this wilderness, into this safe place in the wings of an eagle, into a place like this, to this far off land? What a thing to be asked to do. Are we of the same mindset? Because it seems that this is what the bride is all about. Someone who is willing to go. Far away land. Ask yourself, are you the bride? Will you go? Will you go? The bride is like Abraham, that is important to remember that Abraham left behind the lies of the forefathers as well. Remember when we looked at it in Lech Lecha, verse 19. <clears throat> o Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my, I can't even remember where this is from now. My refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. Abraham left behind all that nonsense. Are we prepared to do it? The same thing.
nonsense like Sunday worship, Christmas, Easter, all manner of pagan practices. For example, Hallow's Eve, which we looked at just before Halloween. Man's doctrine, whether it be, whatever it be about, are we willing to leave it all behind? Torahlessness. See, some people get really comfortable with all this stuff and they don't want to go, no, no. But that's not the bride. The bride's willing to leave it all behind. To be the bride, you have to leave all of it behind. If you are still hanging on to the lies, because maybe you've got friends that you don't want to offend, maybe you like the worship, maybe it's just your kind of thing, your kind of style. Maybe there's someone you've got your eye on. Oh, I like it. Oh, I like him. I'm not. Oh. Maybe you feel good about yourself when you're there. Maybe the lies suit you. Maybe the false God that they preach is a God you've come to love. Maybe you're just not the bride. The bride leaves it all behind, you see. That's what the bride does. Maybe the door will be closed to you. Maybe you'll be asked to buy gold refined in the fire. Let's not underestimate hospitality, by the way. I was talking about it before, but if you were to describe Abraham to someone who had never heard of him, <clears throat> then you would strongly stress one of his major characteristics was his hospitality. To go above and beyond, not just being hospitable like, oh, he's kind of nice, isn't he? We ask ourselves, are we hospitable? Do we, like him, sit at our tent door looking for strangers to welcome? Do we delight in serving others? And this is an interesting bit, what Yeshua taught. It's not hospitality with the hope of a return either. Luke 14, 12 to 14. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbours, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Even in, ah, oh, Yeshua's words are just amazing, aren't they? We should really take them more literally and we should be like Abraham, looking for the opportunity to find people who are in need. People who are not who are gonna pay us back or go around saying how brilliant we are so we get a big head. But people people we might never see again. To look for the opportunity to invite them. When you make a feast, where are they? But people don't do that nowadays, do they? I mean I can't think it's anyone who gets a big party together. And then goes down the road and looks for people who are in the right state and says, come on, come in. They just don't do it. But Yeshua says, do it. That's the way to do it. And look what he says. You'll be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I want to be recompensed by him. The way you get recompensed in the world is just rubbish anyway, isn't it? Sometimes we, we do, honestly, we read scriptures and, and it, oh, that's lovely, isn't it? That's nice. That's lovely. But we don't actually act on it at all. If we want to be like the bride, no, we want to be the bride, rather, like Rivka, who was like Abraham, then we have to start acting like this because this is what the bride was all about. And they were set a meat <clears throat> before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat. There was a back to the servant now. He said, I'm not going to eat until I've told mine errand. And he said, speak on. So, okay, <clears throat> here he is. He's been brought in and he wants to get things sussed. And there's a reason. In the ancient world of the Middle East, one did not eat with just anyone. Unless the parties understood each other and had some common ground of agreements, there could be no sharing of bread between them. Hence, the servant would not eat the food offered him by Laban until he had both A, explained his mission and his intentions and B, heard the response of Rivka's family. Okay, and verse 34, just have a quick swig of tea. Oh, it's gone a bit cold. <laughs> Never mind. And he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. So please note that the servant bigs up Abraham in a worldly way. Right, <clears throat> this shirt, by the way, took, I think it was something like 20 goldsmiths, two weeks to knit. It's actually made of gold. But can you see what the servant's doing? He's bigging Abraham up in a worldly way. Servant then goes on to explain his mission and the incident earlier at the well. 
So I suggest you read it for yourselves and take note of the manner in which he frames his story. Now Living Waters says this, I think that sometimes the Ruach HaKadosh guides us to speak to the world in words that they will understand. Abraham's servant would not have been successful had he focused on the fact that he was on a mission to find a bride with qualifications like Abraham. Laban understood wealth, family and the power of Jehovah. He would not have been as impressed with and even possibly offended by the servant's search for a woman with attributes like Abraham who was willing to leave her family, her father's house, her land and idolatrous practices. So, yeah, that probably wouldn't have gone down very well at all, would it? Verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee, bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord had spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped Jehovah, bowing himself to the earth. It's crazy, isn't he? Oh, Lord, thank you. That should be the way we conduct ourselves as well. The servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. So first it's to her. And he gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Please note that Rebekah is the only one who gets the raiment. But he does... He also gives to the brother and the mother precious things. So they get gifts. This servant who represents the Ruach HaKadosh. So immediately after giving Rivka the gifts that were to assure her of the bridegroom's intention to perform all the covenant undertakings of marriage for her, the servant turned his attention to those who would consider themselves deprived of Rivka's services. Thus, the bride price was met. You can imagine them all, oh, oh, this is great, especially like Laban, because it was his thing, wasn't it? But please note that Eliezer hands out gifts to both the bride and her family. Many believers are fooled into thinking that they are acceptable just because they have been given gifts to the Spirit. The extended family of Rivka has a calling, but they are not the bride. Okay, 54 says, And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. So they had a covenant meal. By sharing a meal together, the participants in the covenant declared themselves at peace, not just with each other, but also with all the commitments and conditions that were set forth in the covenant. It's a big thing. Eating with people in them days was a really big thing. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go, hang on a minute. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I might go to my master. Okay, the servant is well on to Laban and his games, and he's having none of it. Considering he has just had a two-month trip through harsh wilderness, he doesn't seem very keen to rest up for a few days before heading off which says a lot for what he thought about where Rivka was being asked to leave from what places she was bride coming he doesn't want to hang about there he certainly doesn't want to hang about with Laban and he, he's into it he knows what's going on here oh just let her stay for a while they want to renegotiate and they just want to scheme and stuff and he's saying no no we're getting off. I'll bear in mind it was. It was a 500 mile journey. You'd think, well, you know, I'm thinking of myself personally. I'd probably think, oh, yeah, a couple of days before I head back. <laughs> but no, he's, he's, he's well onto it and he's like, no, I'm getting straight back. Okay, and I love this picture. I found this when I was looking for pictures of camels. <laughs> and um, I, just, I just think the world's great because there's crazy people who do things like this, isn't it? I love that. Verse 57, and they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? This is, see, put yourself in a, in a situation and in a position. Will you go with this man? You, you know not hardly about him. You're going to go to a place that you don't know to go and marry a fellow you've never met. And you, are you going to go? A massive big journey, and you know, I'll probably never see it again, or not like that. But are you gonna go? Bear in mind, she is the bride of Isaac, who represents the Messiah. She represents the Messiah's bride, and she says, I will go. I will go. Jehovah chooses her because she is the faith of Abraham to go to a far off, far off place. 
59. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and their nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands and millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Which is a bizarre thing for them to say, isn't it? <clears throat> and actually kind of parallels some of the blessings that have been given by Abraham. Okay, and it says in verse 61, Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man and the servant, took Rebekah, and he went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well, Lachorai, for he dwelt in the south country. <clears throat> and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. So it's amazing that this field in Hebron is the, where we find Isaac praying. That's what he was doing. It was evening, which means it was a new Hebrew day which was beginning. When he lifts his eyes, which is an idiom for spiritual vision, he does not actually see Rivka, but the camels coming. According to our symbolism, the camels eager to drink of the waters of Torah are the bride. Yeshua also will return at the beginning of a new millennial day, the evening of the seventh day. He will be coming for his bride. Amen. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes. When she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. Okay. Effectively, she just fell off. She fell off the camel. Okay. Not a, not a great start, is it? Apparently, she was so overwhelmed. <clears throat> so completely overwhelmed when she saw Isaac that she couldn't help herself and just think just think in terms of what that tells us um, if we're to be the bride of Messiah when we first see him is he telling us that we'll be so overwhelmed that we'll basically fall off our camels as it were verse 65 for she had said unto the servant what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Note that there was not a big ceremony first. <clears throat> first there was the bridal chamber, the place of intimacy. The bride was taken in, the door was closed, and the foolish ones didn't get to go in. Chapter 24 is the story of a father who desires the perfect bride for his son. To make this happen, Abraham enlists the, the, help, the, the help of a nameless servant, it's the Ruach HaKadosh, Abraham represents Jehovah, obviously, who never glorifies himself, this servant, but speaks the words of the father and testifies of the son. The son is absent during the selection process. <clears throat> Yeshua is also physically absent while the bride is being chosen. After agreeing to the marriage through the servant, the Ruach HaKadosh, the bride will be taken to the promised land to join with her husband. The bride will be the one who says, yes, I'll go. Right, chapter 25. <clears throat> then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran. It's one of them where you've got to try and get the names all right here. And Jokshan and Medan, they're quite easy ones, these. <laughs> and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. And Joshkan beget Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan, oh, it's getting harder, were Asherim and Letoshim and Lemum, <laughs> Lumim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah, Ephah and Ephah and Hanok and Abidah and Eldah, all these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons, I love that, he gave all that he had unto Isaac, as it should have been. But unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days <clears throat> of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, and a hundred, three score, and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. And his burial was the first and the only thing Ishmael and Isaac did together, that we know of. So let's just finish by taking a moment to reflect on Abraham, the one who taught us about what it means to be a friend of God. 
Okay, I was thinking about it. <clears throat> and um, the things that just stuck out was like, he was an amazing man. Now, let's just even just think about the first one I've listed here. He got 318 men to go to war against kingdoms of giants. There's just been a big war. <clears throat> And the victors went off with Lot and his family. And they were, you know, these were mighty kingdoms. And Abraham, such was the force of his character, and such had he impressed the people around him, that he managed to get just 318 people who had no clue as to the outcome of what was going to eventually be, you know, what the, how it would go. He got them to agree to come with him to go and rescue his family and I think that is incredible and he must have made such an, an incredible impression on them and I've put it here even more amazing is he got everyone in his household to agree to circumcision he had an impact on people I mean I would think about it even today with the scriptures and what it says, and it's, you know, if you actually go through the scriptures and have it explained to you, it's like, oh yeah, we should be circumcised. We have the beauty of being able to read the word of God, which tells us to get circumcised. And yet people won't do it. And yet Abraham turns around to the people in his household and just declares to them, the Lord told me that we're to be circumcised. And they say, Okay, yeah. And they don't have, you know, the chance to go and have a, be put under and have an operation. And they have to get a flint knife out and do it themselves. And yet, he demonstrated for them with his walk with the Lord in such a powerful way that they, they all agreed and said, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's a brilliant idea. Pass, pass me the knife please and they all did it I just think <clears throat> what was it they were so impressed with his integrity his hospitality his kindness um, his love his love for the Lord I think it must have been his love for the Lord above all things William Bullock Senior says this he did not preach to men about injustice and unrighteousness. He modeled justice and righteousness to them in real time, in real ways, by walking with and following the instructions and guidance of Jehovah wherever he went. He was chosen, wasn't he, because he kept the laws, the statutes, and the commandments of Jehovah. And the Lord trusted him to be able to pass these things on to his, to his children. Now it says here, he did, this is what William Bullock says, he did not claim to be perfect, nor think himself so. He made mistakes, and then in humility he allowed Jehovah to discipline him, to return him to the right path, and to restore both his vision and his passion. And through it all, his love for his God, for his family, and for his fellow man never grew cold. Abraham loved Jehovah. Jehovah was his prize. The bride is like Abraham. The bride loves Jehovah. Oh, and when the bride sees her bridegroom coming, truly, truly, she will be so overwhelmed that she will fall off her camel. But please, Jehovah was his prize. He wasn't interested in anything other than Jehovah. He showed that when he's... No. Keep your, keep that fortune, that wealth, and all that. I, no, I'm not having you say you've made me prosper because what I'm after, I, I will get from the Lord. I just think, um, just from the off when we meet him and he's asked to go, and he goes, and it's simple, it's straightforward. His servant is is brilliant. His servant who who would have <coughs> his whole behaviour would have been probably modelled on. What Abraham's was like, so this whole idea of him praying when he had a difficult task to, to deal with and his whole attitude where when something goes right, he bows and he worships the Lord. He doesn't want to take any credit. And he's doing it as a servant for his master Abraham. Such love he must have had for Abraham. And Abraham would have earned it by the, of the very character that he had, this hospitality and this kindness and this going above and beyond. But this is the bride. 
And if we want to be the bride, we have to remember what the bride was all about. And the bride, it's like Abraham, loved Jehovah. Do you love Jehovah? Are you prepared to get on one of these and go on a big journey? I don't know. Then the Lord says, will you go? Will you say, yes, I'll go. I'll go because I love you. It might be scary and I'm prepared to leave it all behind, all that comfortable stuff. I'll go because I love you. Amen.